Thank you, Kayla. Thank you. Say again? Okay. Tim, we're live. Okay. Could you make me a deal on a boat? Absolutely. Perfect. Let's go sign the paperwork. <laughs> no, we're a little light. This I'll turn that on. Huh? I know we're a little late starting tonight. Kind of was hoping that maybe some people that are stuck in traffic, I'm sure, might be able to get here, but I guess we need to get started. Anyway, you know, tonight we're talking about offshore fishing. You know, a lot of times we, we get real in-depth in rods and reels and lures and those kind of things, and we're going to talk about that, but I want to talk about some things tonight that may be a little bit different that you know about and you may not to try to help you catch more fish. Um, you know, our main focus tonight, of course, is wahoo dolphin and tuna which we have an abundance of here. The county has actually made our life super easy on these species now. Um, I don't know if y'all are familiar with the fads that are offshore, depending on the size of the boat you got. But the county, you know, has put out eight fads out there, which will make life easier. But it's not the end all. You know, if those fads are not in the, you know, they're fixed. Currents move and fish move. There's going to be days you go there, the fishing's great. There's some days you go there, there's going to be nothing. So we can't, while they're great, you can't rely on that as your single source. But just like um, when we go bottom fishing, we all have a list of numbers that we use. Wrecks and reefs and ledges and everything to fish on. Well, there's several services out there that will help you find the offshore species. And that's what I'm going to spend quite a bit of time with tonight. And there's, there's several of them out there. There's Hilton's Offshore, and there's Rip Charts are the two that I use. I have both of them on my phone. Um, most of these services run about $200 a year. There's some that are a little bit more. Um, Rip Charts was nice enough. And tonight we would actually have plenty. If, if, if you're interested at the end, please come and get a card. This is a 10% discount card for Rip Chart service. Um, I don't have a tremendous amount of them. If more people show up, I wouldn't have one for everybody. But if it's something that you're truly going to be interested in and make use of, please feel free. We'll get you one. If we run out or something, I can call the guys. They'll send me more cards. Um, I use Rip Charts more because I like it better on my phone. I do like Hilton's a little bit better on the PC. So that's why I have a subscription to both. It's $200, they're, they're both under $200 for the year. One trip offshore that you missed the bite by 10 miles, well you burnt way more than $400 in fuel and didn't catch anything. So it's, it's really inexpensive. Um, you know, and I think that we're, there's several things that this will show you. It's going to show you water temperature. It's going to show you water color. Um, it give you salinity. It'll give you altimetry. And most people get very focused on temperature and um, water color which both are, both are very important, but I think most people miss the number one thing that it will tell you. you know, so on this one here, this one is showing us um, water clarity, what the color of the water looks like. And you can see these edges right here. This one happens, this is just a shot off their website, but this one happens to be off of North Carolina. But you can see out here where we have this definitive, this is blended water all up in here, and this is blue water out here. We want to 
we would basically want to fish this line. This one is a very similar one, but this one's giving us water temperature. So we can see that there, if we look back on this one, this bow right here, it's got the same little curve to it right here. So we want to be fishing this edge right here. Well, the one, and after we get done here, I figured out a way to an easy option easily upload all these um, slides to our Facebook page. So this one here is altimetry. And this is the one that everybody misses. So we're here, we're talking about fishing this blue water right here, right? If we were just looking at an altimetry picture, where do we want to fish? Anybody? We would assume the blue, right? Because the blue is blue water. And altimetry, it's different. We're looking, well actually on this, on this, this one it actually is correct. So what is altimetry? Here's another, here's a good example offshore of here. Um, now this, this one happens to be, this, this is very far offshore, because Dustin sits right here. This is 250 miles on this particular day. But right here, this break right here is where we definitely need to be fishing. And the question is, what is radar altimetry and upwelling? Well, altimetry is the difference in sea level height. We have positive and negative height. So if we thought about the floor in here, this floor is level, and if we think about the sea surface, even on a slick, calm day, the sea surface is not level. It, there's highs and lows, and we're only talking about just centimeters to inches of difference in this water level height. Well, an upwelling is, coming, is bringing nutrient-rich environment from the depths of the Gulf to the, or the ocean if we're on the Pacific or Atlantic, to the surface. Those upwellings, to me, are more important than, like I say, everybody gets focused on water temperature and blue water. Well, if the blue water is in a bad altimetry, I'll take the green water every time. Um, because that blue water, even though it may be blue, if that water has been on the surface for days and days and days, the nutrient level has now flushed out of that water. Um, so when you're looking at these, these have negative, this, this one in the blue has negative numbers, this has positive numbers. This is telling me this water is higher than this water. So the, the positive numbers in the altimetry, that water will now be sinking. That's taking nutrients away from the surface. This water is bringing nutrient-rich water to the surface. And if we have this definitive break in the two, that's exactly where we want to be fishing. Because that nutrient-rich water, that's what's supporting you know, bait life. It's just like being on the reef. If there's algae and plankton, there's itty bitty bitty fish. And if there's itty bitty ones, then there's bigger ones. And then there's bigger ones, there's bigger ones. And then pretty soon we have a bunch of snappers there, and then the sharks come and eat all the snappers to catch. How many times has that happened this year? Every day. Has everybody, so we, I know we're talking about offshore fishing. How has everybody been doing bottom fishing so far? No problems? You shouldn't be having any problems right now. If you're having problems bottom fishing, you need to come talk to one of us at the shop, come talk to Mark, something. Um, if you're having trouble catching snappers, I wrote in a fishing report a couple weeks ago. <coughs> if you can't catch snappers right now, you need to lay off snapper fishing for three weeks and just quit because you're never going to get it. It's, it's, just, it's just too easy. Um, I ran a trip. It was two Thursdays, whatever Thursday the Emerald Coast Classic was. The 24th. The 24th, yeah. So we, could leave, we were going to leave from here at 8. Well, we had GPS problems. The, guy, the fellow was running his boat, had just bought a new boat, and 
Um, it was actually a used boat, so the GPS wasn't registered in his name, so we had to get Garmin on the phone and get Legendary on the phone, and Legendary had to send them a bill of sale so they would take the other person's email and stuff all out of the phone and get it reset. We didn't get to leave here till 9. We had to be back at the pass by noon, and I ran 25 miles. We ran 25 miles, caught our snappers, and we were back to the... We were sitting at the pass at 11.15. Um, I know we didn't fish 30 minutes, I and mean, we might have fished 20. We had a limit of snappers and a bunch of black snappers. But anyway, back to altimetry. So the little slides I have here go through a lot of this, uh, and I'm not going to bore y'all. I'll let y'all read through this because I don't want to bore y'all too much with, with just a bunch of data. But if you'll learn to use... Either one of these services, Rip Charts, Fishman, Hilton's, Roths, they're all great. And they will, it gives you where to go. And the thing is, you know, and like, um, oh, it's not on that phone. imagery right now and the one cool thing about altimetry it's one thing that you can get the info when it's like the last three or four days um, there are no for water temperature and color there are no good shots because the gulf is shrouded in clouds well the radar satellites can detect altimetry even though it's cloudy So these is the gulf the last couple of days looking at chlorophyll or blue, water color, blue, if you're looking for blue water. So you can see all the little gray pictures. Well, all the little gray stuff, that's clouds. So we're not, we can't, we can tell So I can see a couple little spots out here where I can tell that the water would definitely be getting pretty, but I'm looking at seven days worth of imagery. That's how long it's been cloudy. So this is a seven day composite picture. Now I can find the blue water real easy on this one, but this is all the way out to Lloyd's Ridge. This is 150, 170 miles to that. Um, so let's go back and just see what we have here. So here's the last, here's today's altimetry reading. Stop moving, Timmy. So we have this big positive out here, but closer to home, we have, this, we have this negative numbers here. So we have an upwelling that's much closer to us, and we have this little ridge right there. That ridge in between the two, that's where we need to be fishing. But we get a perfectly good altimetry reading, and we can't get a chlorophyll or water temperature reading for the last seven days. Well, let me ask you a question, Tim. Yep. When you see that on your phone, mm -hmm. how do you translate that into where you're going to go fishing? Because, like, yeah, you can see that at home before on, or on the dock before you leave, but once you start running your boat, how are you going to... So I can turn on bath imagery here. So you're going to ask me questions, and I don't have my glasses on. Now 
that's not what I want to do. Yeah, no, I'm, that's I'm, fine. I'm sure that's what you guys are thinking. We actually, um, here we go. Okay, so I can, all I got to do is touch the screen. And it's giving me the GPS coordinates in the bottom corner where I'm touching. What did you click on that? Just, I just touched the screen on this one. Okay. I can't remember how, I couldn't remember which one does what, but I had to, I just had to change a few settings where I can touch the screen and I can mark. I can mark several places along that line. So it'll give me the GPS coordinates to where that is. Now, um, what, now once, so say you put that in, and I may be jumping ahead in your presentation. Okay. Say when you, so now you have a coordinate of kind of where you want to go. Mm -hmm. You run your boat out there. What are you looking for? So on altimetry, we're not going to see anything. We're going to have to go strictly by the data. If we were looking, if we were looking at a line of, blue water, we would actually see the change. So if we ran, there would be a definitive change as we went from this dirty water into this blue water. And there would be a definitive change. If you, you can look in the prop wash a lot of times, and you just it, the water's clear, but there's bubbles and everything's happening. And as you start to pull out of that green water into that really pretty water, all of a sudden that prop wash is just sparkling. It's just, you, you can definitely see the color difference. And when you look down in the water, you can see so much further now. I do have, you, you, you won't always find something that looks this good. Okay. Everybody should be able to see that break. Now this is typically, you'll find this after a storm. You know, next week after this storm passes by, we may find this 35 miles offshore because there's going to be a ton of river water coming out. It's going to be coming out of the Mississippi. It's going to be coming out of the Choctaw Bay, Panama City. There's going to be a definitive line offshore next week where you will see definite mud to blue water. Um, so this storm may be very helpful for us. I may actually have another picture. There's a, this is a good example of green to blue. Not mud, just green to blue. You know, this is not something, don't expect it to be this defined. You know, we took some of these pictures so we would have really, really good stuff to show you, but we do find where it's that much different. And when you see that, your whole plan for the day is gonna change. <laughs> no, when you see, when you see that oh, I'm not your going, plan I'm not, changes for the day because he's going to change your plan. I'll, spe I'll spend the rest of my day right there. So while we're here, we're going we're, we're gonna to jump around. We might as well just go jump in with both feet. If you want to find this, some years there's going to be a ton of sargasso weed in the Gulf. Some years there's not. He's probably going to kill me. Because I don't know if I'm showing him this yet. You know what this is? This is that. Y'all always made like I've lost my mind. It's a simple fish basket, a pool noodle. We put a couple hundred feet of rope on here and a 10 pound, and a 10 pound anchor to it. You're going to go out there and go bottom fishing. You get four or five miles from where we're going to bottom fish. Throw the rope out, the anchor, dump this over the side, throw a five pound box of chum in there and put, oh, half a dozen cigar minutes in there, just go off and go bottom fishing. When you come back, you're not going to have grass there, but everything that's on that grass is going to be living on this little basket. There'll be dolphin, there'll be dolphins, there'll be tunas, there'll be all <laughs> kind of stuff on the little basket. Now. 
I did have to make a new basket the other day because um, we deployed one the other day and we came back to it and my basket was shredded. There was the handle and a little bit of the foam noodle left because, of course, it had a five-pound box of chum in it, so the sharks decided they liked it better than I did, and they destroyed it. But you can make that pretty easy. You put that out for a couple hours, for an hour, maybe two hours, go bottom fish and come back to it, it will have fish on it. Yeah, I knew I was going to lose that tonight. Birthday presents are easy for me. Okay. So does everybody, you kind of have a basic understanding of what altimetry is? So, like I say, I'm going to have all these slides on our Facebook page, so you can go through and read through all these little slides. They have a ton of information in them. Um, the fads. If you don't have the numbers to the fads, I've posted this on Facebook a bunch of times. You can call the store. We can give you the numbers. They'll be on Facebook after tonight again. I'll post it in a post tonight. For the people, if they don't know, how close is the farthest fad? Or how close is the closest fad? 65, miles and 65 to 85 miles. So I'll, how many people were here for the King Mackerel Seminar? Okay, everybody who wasn't here for the King Mackerel Seminar, y'all can come and ask us about fads after the show. So, places that we can go that are, you know, I know everybody can't go 65 to 85 miles offshore. We don't all have that kind of boat. If we're really going to target wahoos, dolphins, and tunas, where do we need to go? You know, so we have our rip charts, our Hilton's information that's helping us. We have several big ledges off of Destin. You know, the spur sits about right here. I don't know if everybody knows. I, got a, I know I got a picture of the spur. Oh, here we go. So the spur sits right here. These first set of spots I'm going to talk about are actually up here further up. But the spur, what is the spur, and why is fishing in Destin as good as it is? The spur is 68 miles from Destin. That's where the Gulf Stream originates that goes all the way around Florida, back up and goes to Newfoundland. It's part of what's called the DeSoto Canyon, which is this canyon right here. But the spur, we're the closest place on the Gulf to it. That's what really makes our fishing special. So we got these up here. We have three places where the continental shelf broke. We have Mingo Ridge, the South Edge, and the Southwest Edge. And there's the same three ledges with just the topographical and no, G, no numbers and stuff sitting on them, so they're a little bit clearer for you to see. Those ledges are where the continental shelf at some point in time broke. This used to be before, really before I was born, this crack went all the way around. And a lot of it silted over through a couple hundred years, a couple thousand years. We don't know when it was actually formed. Um, and there's, there's some debate as we all call things different things. A uh, buddy of mine, the charter boat captain, was arguing with me the other day that this is Mingo Ridge, and this is the South Edge, and that's Southwest Edge, and that's Tater Ridge. It's been all over Facebook the past couple of weeks. Yeah, we've been arguing about that. This is what we know, what most people commonly call it today. And all that looks awesome on the new charts, by the way. Not that I want to bring that up again, but. If, tell them about blue charts. I can show, I mean. I, uh, yeah. Oh. I'll plug my phone in and show you. Here, while you're, you can talk. I'll plug in mine while we got it sitting here. And you can just be, and you can. Or you can just change phones. It's, it's hard to. Hmm? This is Garmin Blue right. Charts. Yeah, but you have to use. This is just a, it's, a, it's an app. Um, no, no, no. It will work on, they have an app called Active Captain. And on, and on Garmin Blue Charts, let's see, let's come down here. Not 
down far enough? Oh, no, this ridge right here. Can you tell why those numbers are really good? Well, I could go fish. You could literally go fish this ridge. We could drive to right there and not have to have a single number to be able to go down and catch groupers and snappers off that ridge. And we, we you and I did that on a ridge that we found not too long ago. Mm -hmm. One that, and this one happens to be 70 miles from home. The ridge he's talking about is eight? Six miles off the beach? Mm -hmm. Five? And how many times have you caught a limited snapper off the beach? I don't want to talk about that. Oh, yeah. You know, um, so if you have Garmin units and you have not purchased Garmin Blue, we don't sell this through the store. I ain't making any money off it. I'm not making a month penny. If you buy, if you subscribe to Rip Charts, I'm not making a penny. I'm trying to make you all better fishermen. Off the Garmin products, I'm not making a penny. Um, if you don't have it, Download Garmin Blue Charts G3 Vision from Tampa to New Orleans. It's $379. It's a wealth of information that will, that will take you a lifetime to find a lot of the places that I have. Um, if you don't have Garmin's, if you have um, Simrad. Simrad's, you have, to down, you have to get the Seymour charts to have the same basic, the, the same information. Which is quite a bit more expensive. It's seven or eight hundred dollars and, and see more. But if you don't have that, you'd need it. Um, so we talked about those three ledges that are inshore, the, the southwest edge, Mingo Ridge, the south edge. And then there's three, there's several other big areas out here. And we all, there again, you're going to find people that call these different things. There's the southwest plateau the rodeo bottom, Jurassic Park, and the Christmas trees. And when you're zoomed in, when you're zoomed out this far, the Christmas trees don't look like much. Well, I'm telling you what, that's a heck of a piece of bottom right there. These are places, if you want to, if you want to become a good grouper fisherman, you can go to any one of these ledges. We were talking about some trolling lures. Put you out a couple of trolling lures or some live baits and troll around these ledges and just start marking spots. You'll have more grouper sniper spots than you'll know what to do with. You, you, you. I should have all this on one phone so it will be easy. That's Jurassic Park. And you see everywhere there's three little green dots on top of each other. When you zoom in, each one of them little green dots with three has actually got multiple places on there. You can see how much bottom is in here. Well, how did I get all that bottom? I went out there and trolled around. I went out there one day and caught wahoos and dolphins and tunas and trolled around all day and just marked spots. You did before you had that chart. <laughs> but that's, that's what we call Jurassic Park. Right there. But you can go, there. you know, there's no reason for you to not have, for 380 bucks, you can have as many grouper places and snapper places as you could ever dream about having. But also places to start looking to go offshore trolling. Yep. And a lot of times we find more weeds like this piled up against them ledges than we do out there in just way out there in open water. Because up against them ridges, the southwest edge, the south edge, and Mingo Ridge, well that water is coming in from offshore and it hits that ridge and has that little upwelling to it. And that's what makes the grass lines want to form right there. So that's a good place to go find all this stuff. Do you find, I noticed this year there's scattered grass everywhere. Yeah. No defined, at least near shore, nothing nearly that defined. And from most everybody that I've talked to, there's, there's no well-defined grass lines offshore this year. 
And that's because this ever blasted wind that's been blowing since February, somebody needs to go and have a talk with Mother Nature if we need to bribe her, buy her dinner. I don't care what it is, just, just do something. I mean, because how many trips have you lost this I year? I don't want to talk about that. I did get nerdy today, though, and go through forecast models. And it does look like a couple, it looked like, what, two weeks of a high pressure system sitting right over Destin after the yeah. storm moves through. Yeah. Hopefully there's a lot of good stuff coming out of the Yeah. It looks, I was looking at the 16 day forecast starting Thursday. It looks really good it, for a it while. It does. Um, which would be thankful because I've, I've lost a bunch of trips. I know Mark's lost some. I'm, I'm getting just, weird. I'll put it that way. I need to get back on the water. Um, so, weed lines. Where do we want to fish? It, you know, weed lines. Generally speaking, one side of the line is going to be very well made up, and one side of the line there'll just be grass everywhere, little pieces. You have to fish the made up side. If you're fishing this line, of course, we would want to be fishing the pretty water side. There again, this one, you can see how this side is pretty well defined on the blue water side. We would be trolling this side, not on this side. And never drive through the grass. Um, one, of my, one of the guys was in the shop the other day and he goes, yeah, we've got to pull the boat out today and clean all the, the uh, generator wouldn't work the other day. They had sucked up grass and all the the ports, they were trolling too close to the grass line, sucked it all up in there. Don't want to do that. You know, as far as tackle, what do we need? We need, you know, we're going to do this, something, you know, at least a TLD, uh, Oh, yeah. Somewhere, you know, 30 to 50 Tiagra size is great. Some Talica 16s and 25s that you may be bottom fishing now, and some TLD 32 speeds. Any of that kind of stuff is going to work. You know, setting up my tackle for offshore, I would want something that would hold at least maybe 400 yards of braid of 80 pound, and then be able to have a uh, 60 pound top shot of at least you know, 50 yards on top of that, which is what most of us probably bottom fish with now. Exactly. So most of that tackle will cross over. That's what I was going to say, especially because, I mean, if you're tournament fishing for offshore pelagics, you're probably set up a little differently. But for me, I'm going to be using one rod that I can do multiple things with. Right. You know, you shouldn't have, for most of us, we shouldn't have to have specialty gear. You know, if you're going to go fish, like Mark said, if you're going to go tournament fish, if you're going to go out there and fish the Emerald Coast Classic, we need to talk about totally different tackle. But that's a tournament that costs, you know, if you're across the board in all the Calcuttas in the Emerald Coast Classic, that's an $85,000 weekend. You know, 6000 to get in the tournament. But if you win, if you catch the biggest fish and you just paid the 6000 you get this much money. If you're not in the Calcuttas, you don't get anything. It's not like being in the Destin Fishing Rodeo or the Pensacola International Billfish Tournament this week. You know, they're not nearly as expensive. Um, but we need to have a totally different set of tackle for that. Um, it, setting up your boat, you know, ideally, you know, we would want to have outriggers for offshore fishing. My personal opinion, um, if I had the choice between having downriggers and outriggers, I'm going to take downriggers. You know, we're, I talked about fads a little bit ago, and the county put those fads offshore for us. Well, that's just easy fishing. You know, we go out there with two downriggers, we're going to troll four rods. I'm going to stop at the pass, I'm going to catch live bait just like I was going to fish for king mackerels, you know, and I brought king mackerel rigs. Everybody knows what a little, just a regular trolling rig is. We would use this. We would build this exact same rig, just heavier wire. Instead of 40-pound wire, 
we're going to go up to like 90 pound wire. Instead of number four treble hooks, we're probably going to have a number one aught treble hook. For the little single hook to hook the minnow's nose on with, you can use the same one. We can take live baits out to the fads, put one downrigger at 100 feet, put one downrigger at 50 feet, two live baits on flat lines, get a couple hundred yards off the fad, and just start making little slow loops. We call it bump trolling. It's just in gear, out of gear. In gear, out of gear. If the current's running right, we make it stay in gear. If the current's running really hard, it may be in and out, because we want to go just slow enough that this bait over here can't swim over and tangle up this one. Ease around that fad four or five times. If, there's, if, there's, if you're marking bait up in the water column around that fad, don't leave. Don't worry, but don't forget about the other fads. Forget they exist. If you're marking bait, stay there. The fish will come to you. If, you're, if you get to fad number one and you're not marking bait, now we're going to go to fad two. We're no bait there, we're going to go to, and we've trolled around it four or five times and not caught any fish, then we're going to go to fad three. Same thing, we go around it, no fish, we go to fad four. If we catch fish there, we stay there. If there's bait there, we stay there, because they're going to come find you. That's what those fads are for. Um, but slow trolling live baits, that's just as easy, it get, it, easy as offshore fishing gets. I have a question for you, not, yeah. not to go too far out of line. What about, what if you're going to troll somewhere and there's two other boats trolling there? What kind of etiquette is there in the, in the Gulf of Mexico, right? Yeah. Inshore, there's zero. Yeah. Um, if you're going to the fad, the fads are huge, you know, it's like the Liberty ship. Six or eight boats can fish on the Liberty ship. If you get out to the fads, there's, you know, it's not like bottom fishing where if someone's sitting on a wreck that I want to go bottom fish on and I get a half a mile from them, I'm like, doggone it, they're sitting right on the number. I just go, I got enough numbers, I'm just going to go to the next number. I'm not going to fish on that one. Trolling is different because we're not sitting on a number. We're trolling around this fad and we're going to fish anywhere from 200 yards to a quarter mile to a half a mile away from it. So we can. We could, you could easily have 20 boats trolling on one fad. That's not a problem. Yeah, you're just going to run wide open into the middle of them. And yeah. So long as it, you know, everybody needs to be going the same way. And you can't just cut, you know, we got to figure out, okay, everybody's a quarter of a mile from the fad. Let's all go the same way, make a nice little circle. Yeah. Um, so long as we're all doing the same thing, it's easy. You're always going to have one idiot out there. There'll always be somebody who does There'll be somebody who wants to pull up and tie off to the fad and just start throwing live baits. You know, so you do have slow trolling at the fads. We can chunk bait fish at night for tunas at the fads, and we can fly line just like we do for kings out there and still catch wahoos, dolphins, and tunas. You know, ideally most people, everybody's kind of in this groove where, okay, we gotta go fishing at daylight, we're gonna come back at dark, or we're gonna be gone this, 12 or 24 hour period, whatever it is. If you have enough boat, I know all of us don't have a big enough boat, but because I, I don't know what size everybody has. If I had the boat that I wanted to, if I had a boat that was 30 plus feet and I wanted to go fish the fads, I wouldn't leave here till noon. I'd leave here at noon, I'd go catch bait, I'd run to the fads, I would troll, I'd do all my trolling stuff. That way I'm gonna be there at dark, because at dark is when the tuners are gonna bite. We'll start chunking about an hour before dark, cut, cutting up baits, throwing little pieces over, throw some live baits out on some circle hooks, we'll catch tunas. Then all night long, we'd fish for swordfish. Then the, best, then the next best tuna bite is going to be right there at sunup, right there when the first stars see it light. So we start chunking again. After the sun's been up for two hours, now we troll for another couple hours, we run home. So we're gone noon to noon. Most people are used to this leave at 5 in the morning and come back at 5 at night or leave at 5 in the morning and come back the next morning. If you want to go do the fad thing, go out there and stay overnight on those pretty nights, leave at noon. Plan on being there, you know, make sure you're there at the two prime bite times. Because you leave here at 5 in the morning, well, you done missed the morning tuna bite. Well, you're going to be back here at 6 or 7 o'clock at night. Well, the whole, that whole time running home, that was the best tuna bite time. You'd missed it. Um, hmm. 
So, bunch of lures. If I could, if I could only, you know, we could have thousands of dollars in offshore gear. If I could go fishing and have six lures, if I could only have six. Now, there's a lot of good stuff on the table up here, but so long as I had a red and a white and a blue and a white islander, a couple cedar plugs, and a couple soft heads, a black and orange and a green soft head, blue and white, red and white islander, and those two lures, I can go fish anywhere in the world. We can fish in Costa Rica, we can fish in the Bahamas, we can fish here. I can't tell you, cedar plugs have been around since the beginning of time. Didn't you send me a tuna picture the other day? With I love this one. But didn't that tuna you sent me the picture of the other day have that hanging in his mouth? Yep. Um, that's, there's probably been more billfish, marlin, caught on a, on a cedar plug than any other lure ever made because they've been fishing that for hundreds if not thousands of years. Have you guys ever seen what this looks like swimming in, or darting around behind the boat? It's it's, no. it's crazy. It's awesome. I'm sure that the Vikings fished with cedar plugs. Yep. At some point. And there's some there's a lot <laughs> of things that you can do to this too to make it different. And I've never told you about some of the stuff that I've done to mine. Yeah. That's um, that's something we can talk about not on camera. But cedar plugs are great. Some kind of secret, right? You know, there's a variety of hard baits. Probably the most, um, the Nomad lures, they're kind of the hottest thing going right now. Um, nomads are great for things that we can troll from one place to the other. Most of the Nomad lures will troll 12 to 15 knots. They're nice little high speed lures. That's something we can throw in the water when we're going bottom fishing. You know, we talk about this. We're going to run way out here 80 miles to catch wahoos. And I know that the question is, well, how far do I have to go to catch wahoos? You know, we can catch them inside the edge, but it doesn't happen a lot. You know, the party boats, you know, you figure in town we got uh, the Swoop, the American Spirit, Destiny, Destin Princess, Sweet Jody, Vera Marie. That's six. There's a couple more. But between the party boats, they never get more than 20 miles offshore because that's as fast as those big giant boats will go. You know, they're fishing six, eight hours. They can only run, you know, they, most of them can only make 15 knots. Well, they hit the sea buoy every day. They throw two of these lures out. They're trolling to where they're going to go bottom fishing, pull them in, and then when they're coming home, they run them again. Well, between the party boats, between all of them, six or seven of them, they catch a wahoo every single day. Now that's not a wahoo per boat, but they catch one, you know. So between them, they're catching seven or eight a week, and they're fishing inside of 20 miles. So the wahoos definitely come in there. They're just hard to catch that close to the beach. Um, you know, when we talk about whether it's islanders or the soft head lures, any of the lures can be rigged plain or with with ballyhoo. Um, any of the anything other than the hard baits, you know. Ballyhoo's, we sell them, um, and you know we sell them in different sizes: twelve packs, six packs, singles. We sell them pre-rigged at the store. You know, if you're in a if you're desperate, don't have any time, you want to come in and buy some pre-rigged ones. Fine, pre-rigged ones are really expensive, guys. You know, you buy a twelve pack of non-rigged, and they're Eleven ninety nine. You buy a three pack of rigged, and they're eleven ninety nine. So it's four times as much money. My biggest tuna ever was on a completely naked duster, or with no bait or anything, just a plain hook behind it. I mean, it, the head was this big around on it, but it, it's you know you definitely don't have to have bait, but if you know a lot of the guys really like trolling ballyhoo. Rigging a ballyhoo, it's not like in the old days. We've gotten smarter through the years. We're going to pretend that my little ballyhoo here is hey, a fresh ballyhoo. Before you do that, yeah. have you ever soaked one of these in Procure before you trolled it? No, but I bet it would work on that one. It absorbs right into it. It leaves like a cloud behind it. 
<laughs> Say that louder. So they I don't want to because there's people listening. Explain what Procure is for the people who don't know. Do you guys know what Procure is? It's that it's a made out of fish oils. It's a scent that you can add to a lot of your soft. Most people just use it for inshore on their soft plastics. And like, how many times have you seen a fish chase your lure and not eat it? And then sometimes you're like, if there's a little bit of scent on it, would he have eaten it? So I, I keep Procure all over my boat, and there's some on my dashboard, and there's a whole bunch of backups in the console just in case. But to put this thing in a plastic bag with some Procure on it, not only the darting action, plus that when this one turns wet, it gets like a pinkish hue, like a squid hue, and just darts fast back and forth behind the boat. So you have a fast moving something, a bubble trail, and a scent all now on a piece of wood that's been around for <laughs> who knows how long. But Pro Procure works great on any lure that you have, whether it's trout lure, trolling lure, it's great on any lure. But ballyhoos, how easy these are to rig anymore. When you get ballyhoo, they're expensive baits compared to cigar minas and everything else we buy. Make sure we take care of these. You know, you, you buy frozen ballyhoo, think about Thanksgiving. Don't just take it, tear the package apart, throw them in a bucket of water. They're expensive enough, that'll make them, they, they're not going to last as long. Stick them in the refrigerator, you know, buy your ballyhoo a couple days in advance, stick them in the refrigerator, let them slowly thaw out. Once you get them thawed out, buy some ballyhoo brine and or you can get by with just plain old table salt if you want. I take and, first thing I do, we get the ballyhoo out of the package once they've thawed out. I take the ballyhoo and I bend him and just crack his vertebrae. This is going to make sure that he swims really good. Then we want to start up here by his gills and just kind of pinch through his belly and all his innards will come out of his little anal hole there. Just get all that outside of his belly. That way he gets cleaned out really good. Then to rig a ballyhoo, we'll pass this little rig around so you can see it. But this is how fast that I can rig a ballyhoo. Everybody thinks that this is just like, oh my God, this is going to take me forever. So I lay the hook up on my ballyhoo where I want it to come. I want to see where my little pin is going to be. And I mark, I just put a little nick right there where the hook's going to come out. So I'm going to run the hook in the ballyhoo's gill. I'm going to come out of that little mark. Ballyhoos have a long bill and a short bill. Break the long bill off where it's even with the little short bill. This little wire that I have on here, it's going to go through his bottom jaw, through the top of his nose. The critical part is making sure that that wire goes through him straight. If that wire's through him straight, he swims really good. If the wire is crooked like this, he's going to spin and want to spin. Then we have these cute little ballyhoo springs. We used to have this little copper wire. You twist it and twist it and twist it. This little rig right here, you'll see it just catches on the top of the little wire. It screws right on. Ballyhoo's rigged. He's ready to go. And as far as, you know, I'll rig a couple dozen for a day of fishing. They make little ballyhoo trays. The ballyhoo trays are expensive. We want to make sure that we dust, once we rig the ballyhoo, we're going to dust both sides of the ballyhoo with brine or salt. We want to lay them out on, tra on metal trays that will lay in your cooler. I have nice cookie sheets for this. Um, they used to be my wife's cookie sheets, and then when she figured out that I was putting ballyhoo on them, we ended up with new cookie sheets, and now I have my own cookie sheets. Like the time you put live bait in your refrigerator in the, in the drawer. <laughs> Well, I did that too. The best one that I ever did, though. Th Kayla, have you ever heard my story about the food processor? Oh yes, I did. I know. Before Procure. No, oh. oh, that's why I have Procure now. Before Procure, I wanted spray-on scent, and we, it, this was 15 or 20 years ago, and nobody made spray-on scents then. So I got the right idea. You know, I see my wife use this food processor for making cookies and cakes and different things. So I took a tub of squid and I set it up on the roof of the house and let it sit up there for about a week and gets all just melted down and gooey and rotten. And I took it and put it in her food processor and, and I had spray on scent. 
Well, now I have, I have a food processor now because I own that one. It lives in my garage, and she's got a nice newer one in the house. Um, but, yeah, I have cookie sheets that I lay mine on, which the little Ballyhoo trays, they make nice little trays. You can go online, and you can find them where they fit exactly inside your cooler. They're going to charge you like 65 bucks for these things. You can go to Walmart and get three cookie trays for $18. They work just fine. You do want the metal trays. The metal trays, you know, because we're going to have ice in the bottom of the cooler. You can, put a, you can put one cookie sheet down there, make a couple balls of aluminum foil. Instead of another one on top of that, make a couple more balls of aluminum foil so they're not sitting right on, the, on top of the Ballyhoo and stack them multiples inside your cooler. But um, where do you find Ballyhoo? Half hitch. Um, locally, we don't catch a lot of Ballyhoo. Um, you can go out to Crab Island. There's some nights you can go out there on Crab Island with a dip net and a Thank flashlight and sit there and ease around Crab Island and dip up greenies. Um, but we, we, we really don't have a good supply. Most of the Ballyhoo do come from South Florida. They are all imported. Um, but in as far as rigging one, you know, all I have to do is have my Ballyhoo's pre-rigged and, you know, it takes me, so we're going to pretend my little fishy's a Ballyhoo. So I got them all rigged in the trays just like this with no end on, there's no swivel or anything on this end. So when I get ready to rig one on the boat, all I got to do is take it, run it through the lure, slide a crimp on, crimp it one time, hook it to the pole, it's ready to go. I do that because I'm not real wealthy and, you know, I can't have 20 blue and white islanders rigged and ready to go. So I may only have a couple of these on the boat so I'm gonna have to keep reusing it. Well, if it, this is, cr I see a lot of people attach this to the leader and, you know, with the swivel already up here, well, that, I can't reuse that during the course of the day. So I catch a fish, we just throw them in the fish box, cut the top of the leader, slide the lure off and stick it on another rig. Speaking of that, how often do you just, when you do gaff a fish and get it in the boat or whatever you end up doing with it, how often, I know one thing you do a lot is once you get gaff that fish and he's on the deck, you cut that line and worry about getting the hook out of him later. I'd never, unless it's a, if it's a snapper group or a fish like that that I can use a de-hooker on, we de-hook it. Anything that has teeth, I don't, do, I don't get the hooks back till we get home. Gaff it, go to the fish box, open it up, drop him in, shut the lid, cut the rig off. If you want the lure, slide that off, but don't worry about that hook. I mean, Wahoo's got a mouthful of razor blades, even king mackerels. And especially if you fish in a smaller boat, never put one of them in the, you see people do this, gaff them and throw them, throw them in the deck. That's just going to get somebody bit. I don't ever do that. These make a great club, by the way. Um, but this is the easy way to do it. Um, Pass that around. We like. just did. We just got that back. Oh, we did? Yep. Okay. You know, and they make all kind of little fake ballyhoos and stuff. These all work. They don't work as good as the real thing. Uh, the little tuna, the cool thing I liked about this little tuna flapper that I rigged up, you can troll him really fast. Ballyhoos won't troll more than about five or six knots. They won't go very fast before they start to wash out. I can drag this like a high speed lure. This little dude drag 15 knots and just go. Be pretty cool. Um, what else do we? Trying to see if there's anything else we have to cover. What about leaders? So leader um, can vary, for me, can vary greatly. You know, when I'm rigging, when I'm rigging hard baits, something like this, I think this is mainly targeting wahoos. So this is probably going to have somewhere between 170 and 250 pound wire on it. Um, when um, I'm rigging, if I was st 
strictly going for dolphin. If we thought we were going to be an area where there's a lot of dolphin at, I'm probably going to go with 100 pound fluorocarbon leaders. Uh, their teeth, they're, they do have teeth, but they're not nearly as aggressive like a wahoo is. Um, and as far as rigging, there'll be a big debate. You can walk down the docks in Destin, huge debate. Two to 300 pound mono versus wire. My belief is I rig almost all my baits on wire because I don't believe that the fish can see that. There's so many bubbles, there's so many things going on, the fish cannot see this wire. Um, I, for rigging the ballyhoos, I use number 10 or number 12 uh, straight piano wire. Um, what about some kind of shock leader <clears throat> or anything like that? So I use, I don't necessarily run a shock leader on the lures themselves, but if I have, so long as I, if I have braid on my reels, so long as I have that 25 to 75 foot piece in there, just like for bottom fishing, I don't worry about extra on my lures. What about your birds that you owe me? <laughs> Why do I owe you birds? You told me you were leaving them on my boat. Well, they're in the back of my truck still, the same place they were last time. They're still sitting there. Um, so there's, and we could talk about some of this stuff all night long. There's all sorts of teaser rigs. Birds are great teasers. Um, these are the little, these same little uh, fake ballyhoo here that's on a teaser rig. Uh, that's swimming mullet teasers. There's all kind of these things that you can drag behind the boat for attractors. I particularly like birds. You know, we do have one unique fishery that we do an entire seminar on in the fall. It's the first it's the one in October. It's on blackfin tunas. Um, most of the time we say that we always have to go to that 25 mile mark to those edges before we really seriously wahoo dolphin tuna fishing. In the fall, there are a ton of black fin tunas on the beach, and I do use a lot of birds for those. I run a bird, and I run a bird about six feet in front of a cedar plug, and you can just wear the tunas out doing that. Uh, nice, easy way of fishing in the fall. So if you're running, you said when you're normally trolling offshore, you're running four lines. Mm -hmm. Say you hook a fish. What do you do? Depends on my crew. If my crew is good, the other rigs are going to, because the other rigs, especially like I talked about a little bit about using downriggers at the fads. We've got one at 100 feet, one at 50 feet, and two flat lines. More times than not, that one that's at 100 feet, it's going to get bit first. And as that one gets bit and that fish is rising to the surface, the next downrigger gets bit. And that one gets to the surface and the two flat lines get bit. If I have any kind of confidence in, in my anglers, I just keep the boat in gear and we're going to start making a little circle, get the fish inside of us. And my hope is to have a fish on every line. Um, if we don't have competent anglers and mates and captains, we need to clear the other line. Before we even mess with the fish, the rod's got a fish on it, we need to clear the other lines. And that's, you know. If it was me and Mark in the boat, we need to clear all the lines. If I got Kayla with me, we can catch five or six fish at a time. If it's me and Tim in the boat, somehow we're going to have four on <laughs> at the same time, and we're just going to look at each other. Um, but no, I, you know, I always want to have, I, I'm greedy. I want them all. So. <laughs> you remember that, the last double hookup we had? Oh, when you beat my fish off with a net? Yeah. Yeah, that time. Yeah. Why, in the, why would you use a net for a king mackerel? Does anyone else in here use a king mackerel net? It looked like a cobia. It was on the surface. I thought it was a cobia. I got all excited. We may or may not have had Tupperware containers all over the boat, so we couldn't really maneuver too well. Oh, that's right. So has everybody got a good idea of what rip charts? And this is what I really want you to leave here with tonight an understanding of what this is and what it will do for you. This is, you know, we can you can come in the store, we can talk about lures and rigging and all that kind of stuff, 
That's why I spent a lot of time on this tonight and kind of skipped over some other stuff because this is what I think is really, really important for you. Everybody got a pretty good grip here. Huh? I have, I have rip charts and Hilton's on my phone. What, you, what are your thoughts, too, about, depending on the boat that you're in, about trolling between bottom spots? Because I feel like there are a lot of, I mean, walking out of here it makes you want to go specifically troll with a species in mind. But I think a lot of people miss the boat not having this smaller style hard bait that they can, you know. Sure, there's some days when we can go from one spot to the other spot and go 20 miles an hour. That's great. There ain't been many of them days this year. Most of the days this year, you go spot to spot, you're probably going 8 or 10. This lure will troll 15 knots. You need to put two of these out. Go to the, you know, even if we're just going to run three or four miles, put a couple of these out. We'll cut, you'll end up, before the summer's over with, you'll end up catching a dozen wahoos over the course of the summer. And, and you'll just troll the lure between spots. If I'm not mistaken, and I'm, I don't want to say the new guy, but wasn't Destin really founded on sight fishing and trolling? Destin was built on trolling for king mackerel. And then once people trolled, or randomly, I guess people would snag a grouper or a red snapper and go back and bottom fish that spot. So I, you find a lot of stuff, either with good people on the boat paying attention to the water around you, which goes a long way, and that's you. You're priceless when it comes to that. Um, or like just finding bait on the surface, which normally leads to finding something depending on where you are. Mm -hmm. or when you are trolling and you hook something, you normally hook it near something, yeah. whether it's some kind of weather pattern or current or water, or you're, you hooked it over something. Like imagine just you didn't know where the Liber Liberty ship was. There's nobody out, and you're trolling, and all of a sudden you hook something, and then you're like, whoa, wasn't expecting that. And you look, go, and now everyone's got sonar and charts and everything. So, well. So... Anybody, that, you need one? So let me ask you this. Yep. So XM Marine has uh, fish. Fish mapping? Fish mapping? Thoughts, comments? I've never used it. Tim, have you mm -hmm. used the series fish mapping? $200 We'll talk later. <laughs> Huh? I, I haven't. There's mixed reviews going on all over Facebook about it. But you have the you have the app on your phone? I personally don't. I'll show you. Yeah. Okay. Tim, have you used the serious fish mapping? I've I've been on I have a there's one of the boats that I run that does have it. It's gonna take some experimenting to learn how to use. Um I don't think the detailed, the data is as detailed as they lead you to believe in the advertising. Now that may be because I don't know how to fully use it yet, but I've only, I only run one boat that has it. And um, before the summer's up, ask me again in October, and I'll probably give you a definitive answer, yes or no, I love it or hate it. Hmm, yeah. Um, we it came, um, one of the boats I run came with a subscription to it. So we have a one year subscription. We still gotta learn how to use it. Yeah, but it has has these little circles. It doesn't give you again, I may not know how to use it, but I can't figure I haven't seen where it actually tells me, go fish this line right here. It gives me these little circles and it says tunas or wahoos and stuff. And I'm like, I don't know if I, I don't know. Um, I want to compare it to data that I know is accurate. Then we'll find out. Well, guys, we appreciate y'all coming tonight. Next, um, I'm hoping I'm I'm hoping that next month well next month's seminar is amberjack fishing, and I think that we're going to have a special guest right now, um, and him and Mark are going to do the majority of the talking 
if that's the case. This is special guest Kayla after her rodeo Amber Jacks. Exactly. No. Amber Jack was um, bigger than you were. If you haven't watched somebody little hook into a big fish, it's awesome. Oh. It's awesome. Oh, that's not the one. Where's the guy? Where's the dude's name? You guys have any questions on on any of it? While he's doing whatever he's doing, who's um? I'll see the email right now. My uh, live baits bait fish speed is normally around five or six knots. Live bait speed is as slow as you can go. And lure speed can range anywhere from 6 to 20 knots, depending on water conditions. Is it Benny Martinez? What's the, dude, what's the slow pitch dude's name? Oh, the Shimano guy? Yeah. Um, I know who you're talking about. I can't remember. Um, Benny something. Well, anyway, well, that's awesome. we're hoping to have um, the Shimano guy. Um, Yeah, he, he just he just did email. a big seminar for, on on Shimano's fishing series. Right. But he's going to come up. Mark's of course our Shimano rep, our local Shimano rep. But we're going to have Benny up here also, and then have our lo our actual Shimano salesperson. But we're trying to get him to come up here for the Amberjack seminar because slow pitch jigging would work awesome. It does work awesome does. for Amberjacks, but you can use it for all kind of different other species too. And I know Mark is a huge Lure and jigging person. We tricked you into it. That didn't take. That didn't take our um, first drop. I feel like. But we're hoping to have him up here. I'm, I hope I have confirmation this week, so we can really start advertising that because the slow pitch jigging thing. If any of y'all, you know, if, if you if you like bottom fishing, like snappers, groupers, jacks, all of it, trigger fish, mingos, slow pitch jigging is awesome for that, and hopefully we're going to have the master guy up here for our seminar next month and we'll turn that amberjack seminar and just kind of turn it into a all bottom fish species and cover amberjack and slow pitching all at the same time and it's not that technical like sometimes people think about jigging and how it needs to be and a lot of people want to go real fast and, and technical it's are you got yellow cards it it can be, and some, sometimes it's, <laughs> yeah, it's fun, especially on that lighter gear too. That's kind of why I came up with my charter, and that's, kind of, that's how I want to fish. I'm going to get to know my fish. <laughs> well, we appreciate y'all coming tonight. Like I say, first Tuesday of next month, we'll be doing Amberjack for sure, but maybe we'll be covering some slow pitch stuff and have a bunch of toys, new toys to play with that time.